Welcome to the Ultimate Comic Book Movie List channel. I'm Live Action Animation. I am Hannibal the Beat Animal. And X-Men 97 just wrapped, and oh my god, it was insane, man. Absolute, complete insanity. Bo DeMaio has been in his bag. Between the amazing animation, the phenomenal character development, the twists, the turns, the gut-wrenching raw emotion, the social commentary, this show has reminded me why the X-Men has always been, and still is to this day, my absolute favorite comic book property. Oh, like for sure. And if you are a fan of the 90s cartoon, like the both of us were, then you're going to love just the all around passion that they put into this project. Oh, yeah. I mean, whether you're new to the series or a stan of the series, you're going to be fulfilled all around. So here's our full recap of X-Men 97 season one. We start our journey with a news broadcast talking about Professor X dying. It cuts to this new mutant named Roberto who's being taken hostage by an organization called FOH. Or as I like to call him, f*** out of here. So you know he has to be saved by our dream team. Now the real ninjas, Storm and Bishop, came in bussing. Cyclops blasts through the walls in his double thigh belts with that dog energy. Look at the smile. He's weave, weave, weaving and dodging through these dudes, noticing a sentinel hand out of nowhere. I mean, where did they get that? We get back to the X-Mansion. Cyclops like, Rogue, Gambit, where was y'all at? Half Tank Gambit said, we was eating beignets, like everyone else didn't almost just die in combat. Cyclops and Gene talk to Dr. Cooper, trying to figure out where these humans are getting all this sentinel tech. The government says it's all gone. Cyclops like, well, now these humans got guns like Robocop and the block is hot for us mutants. So they pull up on Henry Gyrick, who's doing life, but he was not about helping them. Talking about y'all mutants, I hope y'all die slow, mother. Cyclops is like, bet, Gene, get his and Gene enters his mind through Cerebro. So now we in the desert and immediately get ambushed by Sentinels. The bot ops destroy the X-Jet, but the X-Men is like, whatever, half of us can fly. We do this. Cyclops has the coolest landing in cartoon history ever. And then they get to whooping that Sentinel. At one point, Beast climbed inside a Sentinel, went rock'em sock'em robot on it, and Gambit charges up Wolverine's claws. I didn't even know they could do that. Storm in her best Maya Angelou impression, like, wins, listen to your mistress, creates a glass tornado and fatality all the rest of them. They get back to the X mansion and Gene is like, somebody's here. Magneto is in Professor X's room reading this man's diary. The X-Men like, get out of our house. And Magneto's like, it is my house. We all live here now. This episode opens with Magneto saving humans and the news is dragging him, despite the fact that he's serving yas in purple. Back at the mansion, Wolverine and the others are discussing Professor X leaving everything to Magneto and Beast quotes Mark Twain for whatever reason. Bishop says he's seen a lot of futures, but not one with Magneto leaving. Rogue thinks they should give him a second chance. Hmm, wonder why. Storm and Jean have a combo in her room about having the new baby. Jean is worried about raising the baby as a mutant and tells Storm she hopes her baby comes out white. I mean, human. Storm comforts her, saying she has had the same thoughts. I mean, it really is a beautiful conversation between besties. We see Rogue and Magneto talking for a while in his office. Magneto talks about Professor X and their relationships. Rogue and Magneto have this touching combo, but the real team is the tension between them, so to speak. So Magneto says, do you think your team will trust you if they knew? And Rogue was like, Nick, that was ages ago. Dr. Cooper comes to the mansion with troops to arrest Magneto. Magneto calls that bluff by using the helicopters. They came to put this man on trial for being, well, a, a super douche for a long time. Magneto could have sliced and diced they but he was like, okay. I'll see what y'all talking about. If y'all give me a fair one, I'll go to trial. It's more turned up than the OJ trial. The humans had hate signs. They riled up. They're yelling and screaming. If you don't like America, why don't you get 
During the trial, Magneto gives his best, we didn't land on Plymouth Rock speech. Meanwhile, Jean goes into labor, Wolverine drives her to the hospital, and the doctor is like, we don't deliver mutant babies. So Rogue got to steal his memories and deliver the baby herself. Back at the trial, the humans went full January 6th, trying to kill Magneto, but Magneto and Storm are super OP, so it's light work for them. The humans got them a blicky that shoots bullets that can take away your powers. This dude, I think his name is Executioner, aims at Magneto and Storm jumps in the way like no, and gets shot and loses her powers. Magneto gets flies the judges and the gun into space and was like, anytime I want to, I could unalive y'all, but I'm choosing peace because I promised my dog. Beast tells Storm her powers are 86 indefinitely, so she drops a Dear John letter to Jean and bounces. Gambit catches Rogue and Magneto doing stuff. Now he all in his feelings like Drake. They all gather at the mansion and then there's a knock at the door. And in a crazy plot twist, it's another damn Jean looking for the X-Men. We kick things off still confused as hell as Beast does tests on new Jean while main Jean looks into her mind and sees nothing but blank faces. Beast tells everyone that Jean Doe is actually the real Jean and Jean Jean is a fake Jean or a clone Jean by Jean, mean Jean. Anyway, T Moo Jean says, hell nah, y'all tripping. I done did all this stuff. I didn't help y'all fight aliens. We didn't save the world. Ate Sharma together. I became the phoenix. And y'all gonna treat me like the I? Cyclops was like, now that I think about it, you don't be fainting all the time like you used to. And your cooking do be seasoned now. Oh, so now y'all don't know me. Well, you know who knew me? Storm knew me. My sister would have had my back. And unlike me, she's the real one. So she storms off, no pun intended, and goes to her room. She and Scott have a short spat, and then she hears a voice come over the baby monitor. Cyclops, talking to Bishop, is like, bruh, you from the future. Why didn't you tell us Magneto was going to come be the leader of the X-Men and my baby mama was a clone and And Bishop's like, my bad, my beauty. Time don't work like that. It's wibbly wobbly, timey wimey. Then Beast out of nowhere is like, oh my stars and goddess, I know who made Timu Jean. And can we take a minute and appreciate Beast saying, oh my stars and goddess in a regular conversation? Beast realizes that Mr. Sinister is the one that cloned Jean. Sinister tells Timu Jean the truth about her origin and releases her power. Sinister hits fake Jean with that Darth Vader, I am your father. He hit her with that pimp talk talking about bring that baby to me before I break out some talcum powder and turn into Will Smith at the Oscars. Morph teases Gambit about Rogue as they come out the danger room. He like, hey Gambit, you see Mags and Rogue got the danger room booked for the next 10 hours? You think she finna s boss man powers? I mean absorb his powers? Gambit was shook. Next thing you know, all the X-Men are seeing spooky. A poltergeist climbs out the TV on Sunspot and Jubes. Monster baby furniture starts attacking Bishop and Cyclops. Morph sees Sinister in the shower and Gambit sees himself getting by Magneto. The floor turns to lava and now they're fighting flying demons. Cyclops goes pew pew pew. Then Bishop is like hit me with the pew 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 Cyclops. Cyclops charging Bishop up was some gangster ass for real I'm for an exorcism, punks. pure g status real gene wakes up and saves everybody then passes right the back out that's how you know she the og gene gray then fake gene shows up and is like i am the goblin queen i'm taking my baby up out of here morph tells everyone about sinister and scott is the off i mean rightfully so he has had quite a day now, the craziest thing that happened in this episode was Sinister putting a live ass baby into a tank of goop, like with no breathing apparatus, and it was still alive. But I mean, cartoons and comic books, am I right? So the crew goes to battle with the Goblin Queen, and she is whooping they ass. Wolverine gets to the Rizzing to wake up Jean, and it works so well that here comes Cyclops blocking in his mind. So Jean uses her mind to confront Timu Jean and shows her that she's in fact the clone because she takes her through the mental Olympics. <laughs> they go on this trip down memory lane and they don't remember how or when or where they were even switched. But the one thing they do know and remember 
is Nathan. Now that Timu Jean switched from heel to babyface, let's go save Nathan. Cyclops and his baby mama go full on Dudley boys on Mr. Sinister. Beat him so bad he retreated while doing poetry. Ladybird, Ladybird. Mom and dad overcoming the odds to save their baby from the craziness of this world. But Mr. Sinister infected the baby Nathan with the techno chicken pox, so Scott and Timu Jean have to make the tough decision to send him back to the future with Bishop. Definitely gotta be the first time some white folks gave a black man they kid to raise. Scott, of course, wanting to be a good dad. Finally, a man wanting to be a good dad, and he has to send his baby to the future. So Gene mentally transfers a beautiful tearjerker of a message to Nathan and off he goes. After that, Timu Jean, who now wants to be referred to as Madeline Pryor, decides to leave and create her own future. And we are left with Scott and Jean, face to face, with no clue of theirs. Meanwhile, Storm is in Dallas and Forge is like, Stella, I'ma help you get your groove back. This episode is kind of a two for one. The first is Montendo starting with Jubilee's birthday. She wants to go out and have fun at the arcade, but Magneto was being a bitch. She complains to Alberto in her room about it, and it's justified. And while complaining, they discover this weird video game called Montendo that captures them and Jumanji's them into the game. Jubilee and Roberto have to make it out of harm's way by fighting off and avoiding Sentinels and FOH members. After getting matrixed out of a phone booth, Jubes and Sunspot finds out that BBL Mojo BBL has trapped them inside this Motendo 64. Mojo was like, I'm pivoting out of Slave TV and doing some gamer streams like Sniper Wolf and Ninja. Jubes is surviving, of course. Roberto is getting cooked, of course. But they unlock a new character, Old Jubes. Old Jubes tells young Jubes, stop playing games and get your back outside. Mojo jumps back into the game like Agent Smith and was like, I'm deleting all y'all. <laughs> nope, no you not, homie. This is a lumberjack match. And they jumped him. Jumped him right out of the video game. Meanwhile, in Texas, sidebar, doesn't Meanwhile in Texas sound like a song off the new Beyonce country album? The second part of this episode focuses on Storm. She's been living with this man, Forge, who is a mutant that can create anything he can think of. My man, Forge, is turning on the charm on Storm. He's cooking her food. They eating by candlelight. They riding on horseback together. He's looking at Storm like... Back at the house, they use this machine to attempt to bring her powers back, but it doesn't work. I mean, she was trying with all her grown woman voice, but it didn't work, and to hear her beg was gut-wrenching. Storm has always been a bad. Storm sees Forge in the basement, and he tells her how he helped create the collars that suppress mutant powers. Wait, 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 wait. So you mean is trying to riz her so he can get some redemption? Like, you lied, son. You lied and had me out here and you were the one who created these things that took my power? Like, that's a violation. So Storm leaves, riding out on horseback and sees this scary owl. Man, I ain't never gonna see owls the same way again. The OVO owl bites the hell out of Forge and screams at it. Like, bro, why is you yelling at birds, fam? The owl takes her to another mental world and plays an amazing role as imposter syndrome, calling itself the adversary. And the episode ends. Episode 5 starts off with Trish Tilby, a reporter at the mansion doing a piece on the X-Men. The world calls them freaks, monsters, and thugs, but they're just mutants. My man Beast all on TV blushing and sh**. Meanwhile, Rogue, Gambit, and Magneto travel to Genosha, and let me tell y'all, Genosha is popping. They got tropical birds, beautiful beaches, a bullet train that can take you from your hotel to downtown in seconds. This it's beautiful, y'all. Mutants is outside living their truth, dancing and singing and getting money and oh sh they all about to die. Magneto, Rogue, and Gambit are greeted by Madeline Pryor and Dr. Cooper. 
and Nightcrawler makes his appearance. The council is meeting and having a gala since the UN acknowledged the mutant nation of Genosha. Nightcrawler and Gambit discuss his feelings for Rogue, and Nightcrawler is like, if you like it, then you should have put a ring on it. Meanwhile, Jean and Wolverine are off talking about how it's hard for her to know where her memories begin and end. It goes back and forth between Jean and Scott as they tell the story of when she gained the power of the Phoenix. Then she kisses Wolverine, left field. So left field that even Wolverine was like, yo son, there's rules to this. I pine, you'll never be mine. So Trish interviews Scott like, what's the tea between you and Jean? And as Scott is reminiscing, Tish goes straight Wendy Williams and was like, but didn't y'all just have a baby though? Cyclops hit her with the Drake line talking about, well, if I got a kid here, tell me where it is and I'll come work for you. But like Pusha T and Kendrick, Trish was like, what? Well, I got receipts and you was just at the hospital and the doctor was like, Scott was like, that whole doctor. He wouldn't even deliver my baby calling us freaks. Trish talking about, you want the world to trust you people and then you come on TV and lie? Scott goes off on this leaves her there mouth dropped. Ungrateful humans. The only reason you white people, I mean humans is alive today is because we allow it. We save y'all, entertain y'all, shucking and jiving, scratching and surviving, hanging in the child line, and all y'all do is hate on us. You lucky I don't laser zap your ass right here on national TV. So it cuts back to the council and they talking about a king and queen or something like that. And they agree on Magneto being the king and he wants Rogue to be his queen. Of course, she's not having it, but secretly she's like, yeah, Zadi. Magneto turns his charm up to max level. And of course he gets Rogue to agree. Now wait, let's let's go back to Timu Jean. Tell me how Scott is cheating on real Jean with fake Jean. Nah, well see, Scott and Jean are having this intimate moment about Nathan only to find out that it was actually Madeline and Jean caught them basically mind cheating? I am still mad confused. Yeah, we all are. It's okay. But what I really love is how when someone in the council was like, are you okay? Is something wrong? And Madeline was like, nah, I'm just in deep thought. And Emma is over there just peering in people's minds, sipping on all the tea. This episode had all the lines, but the one that really took me out was Jean, real Jean. She was like, Sinister cut out a part of me and you love it? <laughs> Man, X-Men is messy, boom! Speaking of messy, Rogue tells Gambit that whatever they had before is ov because she's gonna be Mrs. Magneto from now on. And Gambit was like, how, Sway? And she was like, I can't touch you, I can't feel you. He's got a whole magnetic barrier. I can touch him. Rogue turned into Kano and ripped out Gambit's heart. Kalima! So Gambit leaves her sitting there, traitor. During the gala, they do this dramatic dance in the air, all for Rogue to turn him down and choose Gambit anyway. Girl, you should have made up your mind in the first place. Madeline sees a figure come out of nowhere and it's Cable, who she recognizes as her son Nathan from the future, but before he can say anything, he is pulled back through a portal. Then there's a massive attack on Genosha by a doomsday master mold sentinel and it starts terminating mutants. Banshee, dead. Callisto, dead. Sebastian Shaw, dead. Madeline Pryor, dead. Well, maybe, it's the X-Men, who knows. Rogue and Gambit start kicking Sentinel side by side while Magneto tries to save some Morlocks pinned across town. Magneto gets stuck trying to save him and Rogue attempts to go full kamikaze, but Gambit is like, nah, Monami, Gambit got this. Gambit charges at the Master Mold Sentinel. He's flipping, he's spinning, and then bam, impale. But Gambit went out like a G and he said, if I'm dying, I'm taking you with me. He blows up the master mold, but the episode ends with Rogue holding his lifeless body in her arms and fades to black. Sugar, I can't feel you. Space Wars. This episode starts with a battle between the Shi'ar and the Kree. 
Deathbird flies into a Kree vessel and the Kree is yelling, get down, hands up. Deathbird is like, nah, how about y'all just die? Ronan the Destroyer says, I know this pigeon not talking no bird to us. Then, bam, the Imperial Guard shows up screaming, gang, gang, Look, it's the fake Avengers. The Imperial Guard slid on the Kree. Ronan says, we Kree never surrender. We Kree never give up. We Kree never smash. Gladiator punches out his- You got knocked the out. Deathbird ready to send Ronan to the Shadow Realm when she gets a message from her sister, the Empress Lalandra. Lalandra says, hey citizens, y'all remember that Terran that saved the galaxy a couple times? Well, I love him, I'ma marry him. Let me introduce y'all to your new emperor from Earth. And this man is none other than this Professor X. We watching this at home shook that Charles is still alive. But look at the Shi'ar faces. Them folks is more shook than us. Charles has basically been here since his attack. Lalandra saved him, nursed him back to health, and gave this uh, dope mech suit to help him walk. Charles says, you think me screaming make the Shi'ar great again? Got them looking past the fact I'm a human? Charles wants to go back to Earth to see the X-Men, but Lalandra is like, Charles, you know your family messy as He talks about wanting to see his children again, but like, don't you got telepathic powers? Can't you just think them there? Anyway. Let's get back to Storm. She's trying to nurse Forge back to health, and this adversary comes in with her petty party. The OVO Owl is talking spicy to her, saying, let Forge die, the X-Men ain't and That white mohawk not really working for your skin complexion anyway. Here comes this dude Forge with a book of spells and cast the owl out of the desert. So, like, you always had this ability and you chose to just yell at the thing the first time? I mean, how, Sway? Back on Chandelar. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our Empress and her friend with benefits. Charles is like, did that just try to play me? Lalandra says, Charles, you know my cousins play too much. Charles and Bay have a kinky moment about barking. <laughs> He's like, ah, dad, ugh, gross. They discuss how having Charles as king may not be the best thing, and here comes her hate sister. Deathbird is like, fuck that cute talk. That man you loving on is born on the wrong side of the galaxy. They are inferior, they stank, and they got roaches. Charles said, since you want to keep it 100, let's keep it 100. Me and your sister decide where home is, and home is wherever the f we say it is. Deathbird says the most gangster line ever about Earth. Xavier would see his Milky Way ghetto become our new throne world. Lord and mercy, she said that with her chest. She basically said our entire planet was New Jack City. Deathbird invokes the right of Mama Say Mama Sama Maku San. I must invoke the right of Emdasha. And now she wants to challenge Xavier to renounce Earth and all his memories of life there. The Lodger says, what do you have to lose? All Earth has is racism, pollution, and lemon pepper wings with a freeze cup. When the time comes, the Shi'ar Council pressures Charles, but he hesitates. And here comes Miss Petty, here to ruin the mood like, I told y'all we couldn't trust this Earth. He comes from a planet of monkeys. Do you really want to mix their inferior freak fluids with ours? Boy, I could hear the hard R on the end of that one. But Charles says, I'm Charles mother Nick Xavier. I'm going to use my greatest power on y'all. The power of private school education. Class is now in session. He takes them to an astral plane classroom and starts to teach them what the universe is and how it can be better if they stop being bitter. Back in Texas, Storm and Forge make it to the cave to look for the plant that could save his life. Storm says, The demon was not your doing. Forge is like, A big evil owl that feeds on anger and self-loathing? Sounds like Drake to me. I'm chumming the one. Storm is forced to go at it alone and is forced to climb up a narrow corridor as she struggles to make it. The adversary is talking trash like, Give up, you weak. This Oshkosh Bagash outfit you got on is lame as trying to finish off Storm, but Storm is Storm. She finds her strength and her powers are here again. Man, when she could feel her powers, I was screaming. So let them thunder for I am lightning. Ah! Seeing her in her first costume was amazing. She was slaying that look, of course. New hair, booties. But can we talk about how she just decided to go on a quick fly around? while Ford is still dying in the cave. I mean, girl, 
go save him. <laughs> okay. She heals him, but then she sees the news of what happened in Genosha. Back on the astral plane, Charles tells the Shi'ar that they are colonizers and that coexistence is messy, but worthwhile. Charles is still trying to teach these peace until he is hit with a full mind blast of zombie gambit, his children of the atom destroyed. Charles says, Dude, I'm going back to Earth. Lastly, we see Bolivar Trask being ran down by Mr. Sinister, shot him in the back like Ricky. He is asking for death and is visibly tormented by what happened in Genosha. We start episode seven with the devastating funeral of Gambit. It is so quiet in this scene. Nightcrawler delivers a brilliantly personal sermon filled with beautiful gambling puns. Such were the cards, he'd say. I think he was bluffing. Nightcrawler says, we are here to remember our brother Remy, who always had a smile on his face, luck on his side, and he would always add extra seasoning to Jean's food whenever she made dinner. Rest in peace to a real one. While Jubilee is angry at Rogue, Wolverine gives her and us the best message ever. Grief's a lonely war. Rogue's got to figure it out on her own. We pick back up with Rogue and she is on a revenge tour. She goes to a military facility and basically wipes the floor with their forces. She's playing with these tanks like they're toys. While Nightcrawler over here trying to make people feel the Holy Spirit. Rogue over here trying to send people to the Holy Spirit. General Ross is inside bragging about how they made this facility to hold the Hulk. Like, what y'all scared for? This place is built for the Hulk and y'all scared of white trash mutants that dress like the Packers fans? Rogue must have heard him talking because she busts through the ceiling, hemmed him up by his neck, meat, demanding info on trash. Back at the X Mansion, Scott talks to the UN and they are ready to quit looking for survivors in Genosha. President Kelly says, we can't give you people any help because we got plenty of thoughts and prayers. What? Calling them you people? Scott was like, didn't you see my interview? Talk to the watch because my face ain't listening. Rogue goes up north and is stopped by Captain America. She wants information and he takes her into this underground facility similar to the one that he and Black Widow went to in Winter Soldier. So Rogue was like, you gonna help me? Cap was like, nah. HR has already given me two strikes, one for being tardy and one for eating Rhodey's McRib back in the break room fridge. So if I get one more, Nick Fury's gonna fire me. Rogue says, well, if you can't help, then you don't need this. And yeeted that man's shield into another MCU property. She threw it so far, it landed to the actual Winter Soldier movie. It was amazing. She chucked that shield into another dimension. He may actually still be looking for it. Rogue finds Gyrick, but he isn't playing ball with her. Gyrick says, I'm not a snitch. No Takashi, I'll never talk. She sucks him dry of his life force and gets a vision of Nimrod and someone else. Spoilers! In Genosha, Jean and Scott help clean up and find survivors. Jean is able to see the visions and feelings of everyone who died in Genosha and the rats we saw in Madeline's visions a couple of episodes back. They have an intimate conversation, then Jean is like, there's another psychic under there. Scott immediately abandons Jean thinking it was Madeline. Oh, I know she felt a way about that. But it's Emma Frost. She was protected by a diamond transmutation that developed while in stress. They get a message from Trask who tells them how Sinister used him to destroy Genosha and asks them to come to his lab to see what they have been doing in Madripoor. Morph is like, y'all know we can't trust this, right? Roberto finally comes out of the closet and tells his mom that he's a mutant. She's like, we been knew that. We knew you were a mutant after you burned down our second mansion. His mother seems okay with it, but then explains how they need to keep him secret due to them being a well-known family. Cut to Gyrick, alive on life support. He says to an unknown figure, we sure got those filthy muties. You were right all along, person who is slightly off screen. And the person says, bro, you almost got me fucked up. You talk too much. And then the off screen person puts Gyrick on a t-shirt. The X-Men arrive at Trask's lab to discover what Trask and the mystery organization OZT have been working on. And it's a new type of Sentinel. Trask explains what his plan is, realizes that the Sentinel program is a terrible idea, and then tries to jump off a building. But Rogue catches him by the collar, and when Trask doesn't offer any extra info, Rogue drops this ruthless. She sent that man to be with his ancestors, and I love it. Rogue ain't nothing to fuck with. Everyone is shocked that Rogue gave Trask a pavement facial, except Wolverine. And all the X-Men are acting shocked and disgusted. Morph says, 
dog. What have you done? Look at that nonviolent movement died with Gambit and every other mutant in Genosha. And didn't nobody try to save his ass either. Nightcrawler didn't teleport to save him. Morph didn't turn to an angel and save him. Jean didn't catch this with her thoughts. You know why? It's because they all secretly knew that Rogue was right. Matter of fact, fly down, pick him up off the concrete, and drop his ass again. Just when Rogue starts to go off about it, Trask pops back up like the Undertaker and knocks her brainwaves into another zip code. He turned into a half-human, half-sentinel hybrid, so they rally together to fight him, but he is super strong. Bolivar is about that life. Morph gets knocked the out. Beast and Wolverine get knocked the out. Jean puts up of a fight, catches a building with her positive thoughts and chucks it into a river, but even the former Phoenix gets knocked the out. Tribal Chief Trask is handing out concussions like candy corn on Halloween. He has Cyclops face down on the ground biting the curb when out of nowhere, BAM! They are saved by an electromagnetic grenade thrown by Cable who has come back to save them. Gene accidentally reads his mind and realizes just who he is as Scott looks into his eyes. He is really baby Nathan and he tells the X-Men that Mr. Sinister isn't the final boss. We end the episode with Sinister and the Purple Dude talking about how their plan is going. The Purple Man goes into a building and in the back room, big reveal, Magneto is still alive and is captive by the Purple Man. We start off back at the X-Men mansion. Gene and Scott discuss how Cable got there. Scott feeling like a deadbeat dad. Gene telling Scott, just go play catch with him. Gene a real one, for real, for real. Like Cyclops had a baby with your clone and now you're consoling him and giving this man positive affirmations? I mean, she a better woman than me. Cable briefs the crew on what has been going on with the purple guy. His name is Bastion and he has been producing crime signals. He created a utopia like Charles wanted. His dream came true and it was super duper peaceful, but it didn't work. Wolverine was like, my beauty, why didn't you stop it? And Cable says, bruh, the f*** you think I've been doing this whole time? Cable explains how every time he's tried to stop Genosha from happening, he stopped. Beast talks about points in time that have to happen and can't be changed, similar to what was discussed in the Loki series. He explains that Bastion is an evolved version of Nimrod and Master Mold. Then they see Professor X on live TV. They're saying he's been exposed and also somebody killed Gyrus. The news is talking about how the X-Men faked his death and the team realizes they are being set up by Bastion. We see Dr. Cooper inside Bastion's lab, talking to Mr. Sinister. Now why they got Magneto on that X looking like Fifty Shades of Music? Got Magneto up there looking like Theon Greyjoy being tortured. Got Magneto up there looking like he about to rise after three days on a Sunday. Dr. Cooper asks Magneto for forgiveness, saying she didn't know about Genosha. Magneto ain't with that BS. Back at the X mansion, Trish tries to butter up Beast, but Beast told her, don't come up in here with that TMC bullshit. She was like, nah. I don't do that no more. As they try to find out how many people Bastion turned into Prime Sentinels. She asks him, how many more like him do you think are out there? Spoilers. Meanwhile, in Harmony, Pennsylvania, Gene Scott and Cable walk into what is clearly a haunted house, realizing they're in Bastion's childhood home. They find his mother, and as she goes to leave with them, Bastion's plan comes into play. Back at Sinister's lab, Bastion talks to Doctor Doom and the League of Bad Guys about his plan. Doctor Doom is like, hey fam, this is not what I agreed to when I joined this evil operation. I thought we were just gonna harass the Fantastic Four. Baron Zemo says, the X-Men got President Kelly on their side, Crody. Bastion says, I got all that shit handled on God. Genosha's not genocide, it's time management. He shows Dr. Cooper his Operation Tolerance, where he turns mullet-loving racists into mullet-loving Prime Sentinels. All of the Prime Sentinels begin to activate when we realize that a huge portion of the population has actually been infected. From Bastion's mom, to Roberto's Alfred, to Beast Reporter Bay Trish Telby. I knew she wasn't shit. Everyone is fighting for their lives, man. These Prime Sentinels are on another level. Scott uses his optic blast on Bastion Mama, but she waved it away like a kid asking for another juice box. The Summers is, the Summers is, is the Summers? Okay, the Summers battle it out as a unit. Roberto get whooped so bad, he starts using his powers in public. Good to see Sunspot finally using his power. While fighting back in the mansion, Wolverine and Nightcrawler struggle to save the school. Robo Trish blasts Wolverine through a wall, but Wolverine said, hell no, nah, you ain't done with me yet. Trish took his ass to the clouds and old man Logan went power diving through the sky, slicing up Sentinels. How's he gonna land, you ask? 
bunch of hybrid sentinels are in Rogue's room looking creepy as hell when Wolverine busts in cutting them in half. A sentinel asks him, why is he resistant? Logan says, lady, I got six reasons. Then Nightcrawler teleports in with a sword in each hand and one in his tail and he says, nine. You have nine. That's a hot bar. They have one of the best fight scenes in the series. We'll call it the take of nine knives. Wolves and Blue Chew tear them robots to pieces. Kurt start teleporting them out of Rogue's room. And as the last one is getting diced like baby tomatoes, Wolverine gets teleported too. Back in the X-Jet, Team Summers is fleeing, but there are way too many primes on that ass. As the robots destroy another X-Jet, Cyclops goes full Dominique Toretto and drives a Porsche out of an exploding plane. Gene Tokyo drifting while Cable is busting out the brand new sunroof and they stuck the superhero landing scott is two for two now sunspot and jubes crash into his mama's save genosha party and he tells her mama mama they after me prime sentinels say we don't kill you people we save you people then his mama was like sweetie do what the nice men say bow bow Dr. Cooper frees Magneto and he flies off to the North Pole in his draws and releases the most powerful magnetic pulse I've ever seen, destroying all of the Sentinels. I mean, I'm pretty sure he also shut down every computer, television, heart monitor, breathing machine, and airplane, but I mean, you know, why didn't he just do that to begin with? I feel like he could have changed things in Genosha, but everyone realizes and admits that Magneto was right. Spider-Man's like, WTF. Silver Samurai is like, WTF. Omega Red woke up and was like, what the f***? Wolverine was like, this mofo Magneto really just declared war on humanity. I mean, where the hell is Professor X when you need him? And right on time, smash to me, my X-Men. are all bad. Magneto just waged war on humanity. Charles can't walk no more. Jubilee and Roberto are getting chased by racists. Then Storm and Forge appear out of nowhere and send that crowd running like the New York Marathon. Jubilee grabs Storm, crying like, thank God you're back. Ever since you've been gone, they only order mild chicken from Popeyes. Bastion cradling his mom in his hands, crying like, why are you crying? You did this. Bastion is crying over his mama body while the whole town is doing the mannequin challenge. Cyclops and Charles talk about why he gave Magneto to school and Charles explains that he wanted to give Scott and Jean an opportunity to go off and finally leave the school. Something that he maybe should have talked to them about first. The only thing Cyclops wants to know is why the f*** did you put Magneto in charge? Not where have you been? Why didn't you send us a letter? Is your middle name really Francis? Instead he's asking why you didn't pick me as the leader? Charles tries to dap him off. No diddy. And Scott was like we ain't cool yet. Rogue wakes up and Nightcrawler fills her in on what's happened since she got ultra comboed. Storm arrives back at the mansion and she and Jean have a moment. Jean is like, I see you got more than just your powers back. <laughs> Who's your little friend? They regroup and try to figure out a plan to fix things. Professor X comes in to offer peace and at this point I'm like Charles, you need to dead that shit cause it ain't working. Wolverine says Magneto has declared war and the day only ends with him dead. Die slow motherfucker. Charles is like, don't blame him, blame me. What do we do? We we all do. We all blame you for putting that motherfucker in charge. Two teams are formed in order to take on Bastion and Magneto. The professor tells them about Bastion's connection with the Sentinels and says years ago, he went to talk to his mama about him coming to the school. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, you mean you knew this nigga Bastion was out here existing? Why didn't we get ahead of this years ago? Another fail for Xavier. Beast and Forge are trying to come up with a way to neutralize the Sentinel while Rogue and Charles talk by the pond. Charles is trying to apologize and Rogue snapped on him. Damn. Another feel for Xavier. Then Magneto comes out of the sky with like a whole island or something. Charles says, we need to resolve our issues with humanity peacefully. Magneto says, I watched Leech die in front of me. F peace, f your vision. And matter of fact, you died, so all of this is mine anyway. I'm evicting you out of my house, muty. Speaking of house muties, you a house muty. Always chasing behind your human masses to see how they feel about shit. I'm a field mutant, and them masses you serve can die slow. Die slow, motherfucker. Magneto is the embodiment of I ain't a killer, but don't push me. If fuck around and find out was a mutant, Magneto is ready to stand on business. Meanwhile, Charles can't even stand. And you know what? I can't stand how Charles be so ride or die for humanity. <laughs>
can my failure be so complete? They go back and forth, but ultimately Magneto offers for some of the X-Men to be on his side, with Rogue and Roberto agreeing. They go with him as one of them saw the events of Genosha firsthand, and the other had his mom just hand him over to the ops. Rogue hands them a verbal beating, just reminding them of what we all are thinking. We could have all died. Like, did we just forget about Gambit? Y'all tripping. Cyclops and Cable have a great pop and sun moment, and everyone suits up. They look so good in all their original costumes. Charles talking to the president about not pissing off Magneto. Charles is like, let me talk to him. Let me talk to him. President Kelly like, ain't you the nigga that put him in charge? Boom! Another L for Charles. The battle is on as Bastion unleashes all of his Sentinels on Storm's team. Morph turning into the Hulk and just smashing those Sentinels was amazing to watch. Beast smacked a Sentinel with his own hand. It was brilliant. Jean took the fight straight to Sinister and it was good to see her getting back in the thick of things. Sinister runs up on Jean. She starts throwing mental boomerangs at him, but he hits her with that Sora dash from Kingdom Hearts. She punches Sinister in the belly button and then starts throwing bowling balls and jukeboxes at him. Meanwhile, Cyclops is team finds Magneto and goes to take him down. The battle is intense. Jubilee is taking it to Roberto. Nightcrawler is able to hold off Magneto's attacks. Charles is talking like always but Magneto puts a metal piece over his mouth and shuts him up. Charles said what might be the corniest line to date. Magnus for all your talk of ruling the world it is the world that rules you that has made the bitter man before me. I'm a big X-Men fan, but f*** Charles. This man Magneto had to survive two different holocausts in his lifetime. Kiss my magnetic ass, Charles. Morph tries to get the collar on Bastion by posing as sinister, but Bastion does not buy it. Bastion tells him, Know your damn wrong and shut your damn mouth. Sinister got the upper hand on Jean by taking over Cable's mind. Cable also has telepathic abilities, but we are then stabbed in the gut to see him take out Jean while she transfers one last message to Scott. Wolverine is able to take off Magneto's helmet and Charles performs his final move, but Cyclops gets in the way and this leaves room for Magneto to power all the way up and disable Charles. I guess disable him more, I guess. <laughs> then Wolverine stabs Magneto in the back and says, the brave always die first. Magneto was like, you should have aimed for the head. And then Thanos snapped this nigga Logan's adamantium out of his body. Yo, this scene is wild. Magneto is pulling the metal out of his skin. And Charles is like, Magnus, don't do this. One last L for Charles. My God, how much more can we take and where do we go from here? Can my failure be so complete? That's twice I failed. It's my fault. I have summoned the X-Men into a trap. The season finale begins in a bar in a town that is at war. This seems like Charles and Magneto's first encounters with each other. They discuss how to make the world woke again. Charles is still very pro-peace, while Magneto is still against outing himself as a mutant. Young Magneto starts hearing echoes of Rogue's voice and suddenly realizes that Charles has Freddy Kruegered his mind to get him to help. Magneto says, why are you always rushing to defend our genetic inferiors? Let me just go ahead and destroy Earth. But Charles says, the Earth is where all my stuff is at. We cut to the X-Men on Astro M and Xavier takes over Magneto's mind to restore the planet's magnetic field. Afterwards, his task is to help Magneto regain his humanity. We see Silver Samurai chilling, watching the holy fucking shit. We see Iron Man in his original costume. And look, Captain America finally found his shield. Took him like, what, three episodes? Daredevil is on the mean streets of Hell's Kitchen tripping up looters and Doctor Strange using Karmatage magic to do surgery. Val Cooper is yanked up watching an army of primes march to glory. Meanwhile, Glow up Bastion got the X-Men hemmed up and is not trying to hear that humanity Q cold ass line. Did you just try to appeal to my humanity? Look at me. <laughs> Brought a shutter down my back. Scary as hell. Bastion goes full on Skynet and says that in order to protect humanity, he must protect humanity from humanity. Then all oh, Iron Man and Captain America get attacked in the Oval Office. Black Panther, Okoye, and Adora Milaje and Wakanda giving us supreme we wish a nigga would energy. Keep on back. Keep on back. back to Daredevil getting jumped by Prime. Guess he couldn't see that coming. Which one of y'all kicked me? Oh, 
Is that Cloak and Dagger? Marvel's interracial superhero couple? Omega Red is back fighting Primes and now he's got Crimson Dynamo and Dark Star with him? A bunch of Primes pulled up on Psylocke and Alpha Flight? They put the whole MCU in this episode. Is that everyone? Bastion starts digging into Cable and wants to know how many times he went back in time to watch his mama die. Cable says, 200 times. This man was fighting back tears and so was I. Lord have mercy, Jesus. I don't know if I would have been able to stomach seeing my family and everybody I love die over 200 times. Bastion backstabs Sinister. He's whining like a baby. And then here comes the freaking Phoenix. I am Phoenix. <laughs> She manhandles Bastion and puts the collar around his head to free the primes from his control. But like, people fell out of the sky. I'm I, I'm pretty sure they're dead. Then Phoenix Gene turns Sinister into a shriveled up peanut. <laughs> Sucked that man DNA right out of his body and turned him into Mr. Burn, looking like Baraka from Mortal Kombat. Then Gene passes right the f back out. Well, not all the way, but it's still classic Gene fainting. Bastion explodes out of the rubble and rips Cable's arm right off of him and then beats him with it. Why are you hitting yourself? Why are you hitting yourself? <laughs> he uses it to cover himself in armor and heads straight to Charles and the others to hurl Asteroid M down to Earth. Bastion said, everybody's gotta die now. On Asteroid M, Rogue is tending to Charles and Magneto while Cyclops and Nightcrawler tend to Wolverine. He's alive and healing. Charles tries to help Magneto regain his humanity so they can help stop Bastion, but Magneto has lost his memory temporarily. Jean makes a psychic phone call to Cyclops and then Professor Xavier conference calls in with the both of them and says that he has to repair Magneto's mind. In order to save the world, we must not lose him. Jean says Bastion is the future incarnate, so the space team braces themselves. Roberto says that he's most definitely cooked, and he's okay with that. Rogue quotes their guardian angel, Gambit. Odds may be bad, but the cards are always in the X-Men's favor. <laughs> As Bastion approaches, Rogue is red, and she's got all the amazing lines for the finale, baby. Rogue definitely getting her lick back. Punched him from the window to the wall. Rogue must have been trying to make juice because she beat Bastion to a pulp. <laughs> Wait, can she breathe in space? Bastion heals and gets the jump on Rogue. Here comes Sunspot, in for the save, with a line for himself. The name Sunspot definitely got more flair. Man, I love that. Back to these races that humans. Of course, they're trying to kill everybody by initiating the Magneto Protocol. Black Panther was like, this is most certainly not a good idea, my guy. And Captain America is like, this black man is right. Maybe somebody should listen to it. But of course they don't. And how does that turn out for them? Back at the War of Minds, Charles is struggling to help Magneto overcome his pain. And I mean, let's be real, that it would absolutely take more than five minutes to recover, my guy. I mean, mutant or not. Bastion carries the chaos onto the ship, and Nightcrawler and Jubilee take the fight to him. That's why I love the X-Men. They don't believe in one-on-one -on -one fights. Cyclops jumps in and he and Bastion go toe-to-toe -to -toe in optical combat, while Scott saying, You'll never hurt my family again! But Bastion is able to come back with four tentacle blasters. Jubilee makes the save for Cyclops and Bastion tries to play the shit out of her. What will you do, child? Slay me with the 4th of July. Jubes is like, pull my beer, bitch, and blow this f***ing face off. A sentinel bursts through the ceiling and it's Beast and the others inside. Cyclops tries to reason with Bastion, but he is not hearing it. And here comes the missiles from the dumb humans blowing up the asteroid. Gene wraps everyone in a mental shield and Bastion decides to jump to his death. So I guess the humans did something right. Sunspot catches Jubilee as she falls out of the asteroid and brings her to safety. But, um, can she breathe in space too? Can all the mutants breathe in space? If they don't stop the asteroid, it'll destroy Earth, so Cyclops says that he can try and stop it with his optic blast, which will kill him, and he accepts his fate. He and Jean go to see Cable to say their goodbyes, showing his son his eyes for the first and last time. I mean, if your eyes were dry during that scene, you are a monster. You have no heart. Scott is forced to say goodbye to his son again after only a short time with him. Back on Earth, the news relays that if the asteroid hits, everybody is gonna die. Bet y'all feeling different about sitting in Missiles up there now, huh? Morph gives Wolverine some encouragement as Gene. I love you, Logan. Stay with me. They don't have enough power or momentum to stop. As hard as they try, they won't give up. Nightcrawler prays over Charles and Magneto, and Professor X pushes the limit to help him remember. Professor X says, You are family. We are family. And Magneto awakens. Magneto. Everyone goes to rally and look at these dirty ass 
humans cheering. Now y'all want to be on our side? As they ascend, the core explodes and everyone disappears. Six months later, Forge is surprised by Bishop. Nigga, where you been? Why are black people always late? Bishop on CP time tells Forge, Luckily this ain't our first time that the X-Men are dead tells him that someone pulled everyone through time. So Rogue, Nightcrawler, Beast, the Professor, and Magneto are years back in ancient Egypt, while Scott and Jean were transported into the future and are introduced to Clan Ascani, where they see Nathan as a boy. We end with Rogue and the others saving an Egyptian in need and oh, stars and garters. It's Apocalypse. And there's an end credit scene. We see Apocalypse in present day Genosha. So much pain, my children. So much I don't know how to begin. I don't know how to start. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know what to say or where to begin. Um, yeah. All right. Listen, that that finale just, <laughs> man. Oh, my God. Wow. Disney, Marvel, bring back Bo DeMaio, okay? I'm that sorry, man. Home. First thing, Bo DeMaio, sir, good sir, kudos Jeez. to you. Okay, that. a round of applause, and we both feel like that bag is deserved. Up until now, WandaVision has been my favorite of the Marvel TV shows, right? But man, <laughs> the X-Men 97, y'all did a thing. Y'all definitely did a thing with this. If Hold My Beer was a series, this would be the series. Like, mm -hmm. from beginning to middle and end. And I just want to say, like, it's so hard to find a series that's able to cater to all of the characters in this circle known as the X-Men. You know, mm -hmm. you have all of the X-Men and while you have your heavy hitters, your Cyclops, your Jean, your Professor X, who you know are going to get the bulk of the story, all of your sub characters, uh, your morph, your your jubilee, like we got so much more jubilee, and we got so much more of what her actual potential is and how strong she actually is, and I love that. Even Sunspot being a brand new character coming in 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 the realm of this series, right? Mm -hmm. Being new and still not only getting a backstory, but you understand his personality. You see his growth throughout the entirety of the season and his ending is beautiful. You know what I mean? From being like, I don't even want to talk about mutants to mm -hmm. I am living in who I am. I am Sunspot. Definitely got more plans. The way everybody's story and character development was able to take place over a series of 10, 30 minute episodes. 10, 30 minute episodes. Do you know how hard it is to make a complete whole story in mm -hmm. 10 episodes? That's insane. We got a chance to meet and, and understand so many of these characters. Like, yeah. you you know who Professor X is and what his motivations are. You understand who Magneto is and what his motivations are. You understand Bastion. You understand Rogue. You understand Nightcrawler, Gambit, Jean Grey, even Madeline Pryor, right? We Madeline Pryor. Bastion is a great villain, top to bottom, front to back. I love how he was created, how he was born. His hate for mutants was literally written into who he was as a person. He couldn't help himself from hating people. And it speaks a lot to the symbolism of children being indoctrinated to hate. I also love the visual aesthetic of the show. It looks like a Saturday morning cartoon, but but it's animated like anime. In the Genosha attack, when Master Mold starts attacking Genosha, and it does those very hard, fast cuts Even looking at that power kick that Rogue does in yes. North, it's very reminiscent of her character in your Marvel vs. Capcom video games and stuff. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and I love that they included those details because like they did it for her. They did it with Wolverine uh, when he was uh, fighting in the sky. They also did it in the last episode. They did it with Cyclops where he was like, "Don't talk about my family," and then he just <laughs> and he does the, the mega optic blast right from Marvel vs. Capcom. One of the things that I loved about this the show was how it created like what felt like permanent stakes right like yeah. when, like when gambit dies um 
we all feel that from the opening moments of the first episode we see him pining for rogue wanting to be with rogue flirting with rogue talking to rogue and, 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 and you know by episode two that it's just like she's not in, you know what i mean like yeah and for him to like sacrifice himself so it's like when episode five happens and he dies we feel it because we've spent episodes building up to this mm -hmm. even in the characters that you perceive have died like when cable gets the telekinetic blast on gene and we're like oh my god she projects this message to Scott. Like, I love you. You know what I mean? Like, did we lose Gene? Like, we just lost Gambit. We, we just lost Gene too. And then you turn right back around and you have the Wolverine scene. And you're like, it's just from, from episode one, it starts off and it's literally like, ta, 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 it's kind of like the heartbeat as it accelerates. So every episode is your heartbeat accelerating mm -hmm. all the way to the brink of episode 10. And that pacing is exceptional. I also love that they use as many of the original voice actors from the original show. They all had to re-audition for their roles, right? So really? They, okay. Yes, all of them had to re-audition for their voice acting roles. So it wasn't just, they didn't just go back and grab everybody because the original Jubilee voice, she didn't voice Jubilee this round. Someone else did but she didn't voice old jubes who's the voice actor that plays storm because she oh my god watching storm get her groove back when she overcomes her fear as she fights the adversary and the actress who voiced storm also voiced the adversary just her name is allison seely smith she has iconic lines in this series and yeah. although we got a good piece of storm in, in the 90s version of it, it, we really got to dive deep into Storm. Just her being that mother figure as a whole of the show and then showing us in the beginning of the show, like, yeah, loss is coming. And it is how we rise from this loss that's going to be the staple of how we get through this season. Miss Allison, you are absolutely amazing. And if you ever want to grace these beautiful black children, Okay. If you ever want to grace us with your presence on the Ultimate Comic Book Movie List channel, we are down. <laughs> Bo DeMaio, uh, as the showrunner, I can't imagine what this show would have been like if somebody else had run this. You know, and you can tell he, he was very strategic in how he wanted this show to work. I feel like oftentimes, even in wrestling, you pick how you want the story to end. Mm -hmm. right and then you work your way back mm -hmm. that is a brilliant way and I, I don't know that he did this particularly but it seems kind of like he knew where he wanted to go mm -hmm. and then the meticulousness of trying to get there to be able to again in 10 episodes mm -hmm. leave mm -hmm. such an immaculate story that has a clear beginning mm -hmm. middle and end while still giving you a cliffhanger like mm -hmm. even if they don't come back with another season that's a whole show word on the street is that they've already ordered more seasons or they would like to order more seasons so if that's the case you only have two seasons that Bo DeMaio has already because he already had season two under his belt or mm -hmm you know, plot it out or anything like that. So after that, what are you gonna do? I know when we grade the movies, we use an A to F grading scale, A plus to F minus, right? So I'm curious, if you were grading this show, what grade would you give it after watching the finale? If you could grade it the same way? For me, A plus. A plus, same, same, A plus TV show. A plus, A plus. You may have to start a TV list. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Way to go, Marvel. Mm -hmm. They were like, just bear with us. If you give us a little bit, little time, we're gonna pump out some, some brilliance just, you know, yeah. take the ride, man. Take yeah. the ride. For anybody who said that the Marvel Cinematic Universe, that the MCU was dead, X-Men 97 was like, hold my beer. Because this yeah. show... I can't believe that this whole phenomena is over for now. We have to wait for season two. Hopefully we get a little bit of news as to when season two will be dropped. But let us know in the comments below how did you like x-men 97 did you enjoy it did you hate it are you still processing like we are <laughs> yeah. did, did, did you have a favorite episode or a favorite fight scene who's your favorite character what villain did you want to see more of let us know all that in the comments let's have a conversation about the greatness of x-men 97 yes until next time 
Take care of yourself. This has been amazing. We will see y'all next time. Bye.